trust to be filled out. Sarah, are you doing this together or separately? I think we're doing it separately. Okay, perfect. Okay. So, um, Sarah teach out with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. Um, and I believe you had some questions about the impact um, hospital price cuts would have on our numbers. And so that's what I was prepared to talk about as well as some estimates and some other examples. Um, yeah, basically, um, We've heard repeatedly from hospitals that Vermont consumers may not see the full benefit of a cut that would put in place um, unless it was at the beginning of the contract year, which I understand is January 1. So um, I thought I heard clearly from you that the last time you were here that um, Vermonters would see the benefits of those cuts, and in fact, it gets compounded by prolonging the date of the cut. So I was hoping you could address all those issues again. Sure. Okay. So I wanted to talk first about who benefits from a hospital price cut. Um, and I was going to start with um, members, Vermonters, um, all members who have cost sharing, deductibles, and co-insurance would immediately see the impacts of a hospital rate cut. So um, just to give you a little clarification, um, high deductible health plans are a large component of that. And that's about um, almost 34% of our members are in those types of plans. Um, the next thing would be self-insured employers or businesses would also immediately see the benefits of a hospital rate cut. So they would see it in the payments that they're making because they're self-insured. Um, that's about 58.2% of our members. Um, and then fully insured members, and so this is the piece, and oh, to give you an example of self-insured, um, that could be high plans, so the schools would immediately see the benefits. For fully insured members, and I think we've often talked about the qualified health plans with those, um, they would see two, the reduction in two ways. So in 2019, if it was done soon enough that it could be built into our rates, um, it would be included in the estimates of the qualified health plan rates for 2019. In addition, um, any amounts that are reduced in 2018, and so this is where the piece is with the more months that you see, um, would also be included in the 2019 rates. So and you would see that um, in our presentations there. Can you remind us how many you have in QHPs now? Um, it's about 70,000. And how much in large group? Hold on. Um, about 15,000. And how much in ERISA? Uh, I had about 58%, um, which is 165,000 members, roughly. Okay. Um, so I was anticipating maybe some of your questions. Um, so one of the questions I anticipated is why are um, hospital price reduction sooner um, is more impactful than one done later? Um, and that's because of three reasons. One, it lowers health care costs to the entire health system immediately. Um, another is that there's the immediate benefit that I talked about earlier to members and to employers. Um, and the third is the um, longer term benefit that would be realized by fully insured members in 2019. So to say that more clearly, um, any 2018 rate cut will mitigate the 2019 premiums. Is there any shrinkage of funds or anything that we should be concerned about? There seems to be a common concern that not all the money will actually end up to the consumer. So the only thing that I would say there is that not all the money is through the qualified health plans. It's across all of our numbers. So if you and think- they consumers too. Sure, yeah. So it, it would go across all the different types of numbers that we have. Um, and I think 
because you, you know, the Green Mountain County Board reviews the qualified health plans, that's where you're going to see it, but you won't see it all in that one segment of our population. Well, we review more than the qualified health plans. We also have the, the large group. True, and you'll see it in those places as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um, so then I was going to jump to the estimates that we prepared for you, and I know you have your own staff that does estimates for you as well. Um, but to give you an idea for the qualified health plans, um, in 2017, um, about, let's see, one-third of those um, members um, received their charges through a UVM MC facility or a UVM MC provider. So, just to give you an idea of who, who's impacted in that group. Um, if you looked, we took a look at our 2017 calendar year charges and trended them forward um, and estimate that each 1% reduction is worth about $280,000 for each month that is reduced. Just to give you a per month per 1%. So um, the impact, if you started on July 1st, just as an example, with 1%, is about $1.6 million. And the impact, if you started on October 1st, is $870,000. You know, those are rough numbers. We do see more of our claims in the end of the year. Tara, is that across your entire book of business? Um, you know, it is, let me check my notes, it's for Qualified health plans, large group insured, and ASO. I think the um, federal plans are excluded from that. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I was going to talk a little bit about how we would operationalize a reduction, and I know you've, you've heard some of this before, but just um, to repeat a little bit, um, we can accommodate a flat percentage rate reduction across the board, um, and we would probably apply it to the DRG case rates. DRGs are diagnostic-related groupings um, in the fee schedules for inpatient, outpatient, and physician charges, um, and that's how we would be able to handle it in the four-week time frame that we talked about before. Um, I think I just want to say again so that you know we could do it if it was implemented any any time of the month. It doesn't need to be on the first. And I think that was a question that was asked before. Um, and we would open our contracts with a Green Mountain Care Board board. Um, and then typically we adjust um, the fee schedule on January 1st. In a typical year when you make your hospital budget orders in October. It's, it's not until January 1st when you actually see the change in the schedules. Um, and so... Plus one, two, zero, three, oh. nine, eight, four, <laughs> nine, five, one, five is now joining. I think that might be MVP. That's MVP on the line from New York. I I heard that MVP, sorry, I'm late. So um, this is Sarah Keechow from Blue Cross Blue Shield still testifying, and Susan will be up here in a minute. Okay. Um, and then just the last thing I wanted to touch upon is that there has been some precedent for reducing rates in the past. Um, we looked at Rutland Regional Medical Center's rate reductions that were done in 2006. They were done in 2016 on the FY15 budget. So the um, and you're probably aware of this already, but they did an, the first part of the decrease effective May 1st, 2016, and that was for 3.7%. And then they did the additional reduction on October 1st, 2016 for a total of 5.1%. And so that's, it has been done in the past. I can try and answer questions if you have them, but those were the main points that I was trying to make. So are there questions for Sarah? I have one question. If you had, so you had indicated if you were to turn around the rate cut in four weeks, you'd do across the board, across all uh, related DRG groups. Uh, if you had additional time, would you be able to do something more targeted? So for example, one of the areas that last year in our uh, hospital budgets we were looking at was the pay parity issue. Mm -hmm. I think um, if you ordered us to look at that, we could. <laughs> um, and certainly, it takes more time to, to go through and you know, analyze each of the different types of services and codes. Thank you. 
Other questions? If you want to go through those insurers first, that so we're going to, I guess we'll hear from MVP. Sarah, if you could stick around just in case there's public comments or questions. Yeah, I'll be ready. <laughs> Thank you. So welcome, Susan. Hello, this is Susan Krakowski for MVP. Hey, could um, you introduce who's on the phone? Yes, too? I will. So on the phone, we have Kathleen Fish, who's our chief actuary, and George Thompson, who's vice president of network management. So he handles the provider contracting side of things. So I think Kathleen is going to start us off. And the question that we were asked to address is, uh, because you've made the decision that you will implement any rate cut in October, so in October 1 with the next year's hospital budget orders, we were asked to, how would that show up in rates? So that's the question that we're prepared to talk about today. So Kathleen, I'll turn it over to you. Can you hear? I can. Thank you, Susan. Okay. So we um, would be filing our exchange rates um, well before that. And what we have typically done when we are um, asked to file rates before we know what the approved rate increases will be is we assume the most recent approved rate increases for that time period. And then we update them through the course of the rate review um, to reflect the most current information uh, prior to rates being approved. So in the cycle last year, we had been asked by l &E to adjust our trend assumptions based on the requested rates from the hospitals. And then we were finally asked to adjust them from the Green Mountain Care Board based on what they ultimately approved. And that was done prior to the final rate approval. So if a similar cycle happened this year, we would reflect any rate um, reductions for that hospital and all the other approved hospital rate increases prior to finalizing and getting, you know, final rate approval from Green Mountain Care Board. And it would all benefit the 2019 rates in the same way Sarah explained. Other questions of Kathleen? No. Okay, um, Kathleen and George, it looks like there are no questions. This is probably my shortest time ever in a chair in front of anybody. Simple story. Yeah, simple story. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I will be here if there are any questions. And thank you, George and Kathleen. Well, before you get out of the chair, I will ask a couple of questions because uh, we got some numbers of lives from um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, but could you update us on your numbers of lives now? Sure. Um, Kathleen, I have a rough idea of our numbers. Do you have um, perhaps more accurate numbers, do you think? I know Matt Lombardo does. Yeah, we have, um, we have roughly 20, uh, just shy of 29,000 <coughs> members in, in our fully insured products. And that would be large group and exchange products? Correct. At some point, if you could just break that down for us, that'd be super. Okay, yes, I, um, I will do that and get that to you. Okay. Thank you, Susan. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this time I'll open it up to the public if you have any uh, comments or questions. Plus one eight zero two five two two seven three zero seven is now joining. Multiple people are now exiting. <laughs> <laughs> wait for the exit. Um, I'm Carmen Austin, and I am the Vice President of, uh, of Commercial Payer Contracting at the University of Vermont um, Health Network. And in full disclosure, I am a former employee of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and also MVP Healthcare. My responsibilities there were hospital contracting and in both Vermont and New Hampshire. So in a letter from Dr. Brumstead to Chairman Mullen, to you Chairman Mullen, um, dated on March 13th, he stated our proposed 0% rate change would create immediate and substantial savings by keeping commercial rates flat, and even as hospital expenses uh, rise due to inflation. So my question to the board is, at a 0% increase at the medical center would essentially result in a reduction in premium. 
what will that equate to in premium reduction and can you quantify the percent and or value of that reduction? Not without our action rates doing the work. Without our action rates, we do the work in the rate review process. Okay. Do you want to direct your question to the two insurance companies that are here? Uh, sure, I would be I, I would be happy to direct the question to each insurer. Yeah, we, we can't answer that question Sarah? right now. Sarah, teach out with Blue Cross and Blue Shield. You're in the similar boat, Susan? Yes, exactly. Okay. Is there any other member of the public that wishes to uh, make a comment or a question? Yes. A series of questions on Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network. Um, understand the relationship to co-pays and understand the relationship to ERISA plans, but it would it would be good to put perspective around what your total premiums are as it relates to the employers that buy insurance through either of your entities, because those premiums would not change until January 1st, correct? Um, Susan Gorkowski from MVP. For um, exchange members, yes, that's true. However, for large group, it's possible there are some large groups that renew at different times during the year. So something perhaps could be shown for them. Okay, but the normal period is what date that that would happen for the majority of your plans? By far, it's January 1. Okay, okay. So, um, and, um, and you then- want to get it, Blue Cross to answer too? Or? I thought, Go ahead. Uh, we're in the very similar position. Yeah. So okay. I thought she was shaking her head there. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, uh, then the other question is is and you probably don't have this answer, but it's been clear from some other filings. Um, out of your medical expense base, how much of it is related to? the oversight of the Green Mount Care Board as a percentage. I think I saw some filings that is between 45 and 55 percent. Right. Um, Sarah teach out again, so ours is about 50 percent. Okay, so, so fair. Okay, do you have an understanding if the year-over-year -year cost growth has been growing more quickly on the 50 percent out or the 50 percent in? That's a very important question here to understand the dynamics and what the hospitals are doing. Susan for MVP, I do not know that. Um, I think it depends on which time frame you're looking at, so we would have to go back and look at it. Okay. And, and then, at least from a hospital perspective, and I want to make sure that I reference the right rates here as far as the gross. And this is, you know, somewhat in relationship to that. And this is purely for Blue Cross Blue Shield because that's what I pulled off the Green Mountain Care Board website. But, and this comes from your actuarial analysis um, dated January 11, 2017. Um, in here, there's a number of factors that you do to understand the rate setting part of what you're going to charge your employers. And the best I could make out of it, that if you look at this, as you said, the trend rate from 2017 to 2018 was 5.4%, okay? There was also an additional trend rate that 16 actual ran over by 1%, 1 percent, 1.1. And when you came in front of the Greenmont Care Board before, that percentage there was 5. 3%. So if you were if you were to add those two together, that would be an aggregate increase of 6.4%. So I just want to talk to the Vermont hospital system growth from actual to actual. 2014, it was 1.6%. 2015, it was 5%. 2016, it was 4.4%. And in 2017, it was 2.8%. 
And I think the rate approval that was attached to this filing was 9%. So my point is, is the hospitals are doing a very good job as a whole of managing cost. And what you're seeing as incremental cost increase is the other 50%. And that's what we need to work to figure out. Because it is important to Vermonters. Because if you continue to take the burden from a premium perspective, that the 50% that isn't there, and put it on the 50% of the hospitals, which from many benchmarks are doing very well, very well for managing cost and quality, I'm very worrisome just from a financial analytical perspective, not from the health network, about the financial sustainability of the hospital system in the state of Vermont. Thank you. Um, Sarah Teach out with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Vermont. So there's a lot there to talk about, <laughs> and we'll talk about it again in our rate hearing. But that's a little bit of a simplified view of what's going on. Um, and another component that wasn't mentioned is the cost shift, which we also know is a growing piece of the yeah. spending here in Vermont. I would like to respond to a cost shift because I did see that in our rating. Just a second. Okay. Can you finish, Sarah? Uh, yeah, that's okay. okay. Go ahead. Thank you. So um, those hospital numbers that I that I referenced, those are inclusive of the cost shift from the 50% on the hospital side. So once again, if there's cost shift, it's from the other 50%. Because these numbers include the cost shift. Okay, Mike. Yeah, so, so one, one question I would have is, and I don't know how uh, the, the rates are, uh, done in the actuarial space, and I don't know all the pieces and parts that you, that you guys go through. But if if there's an immediate reduction from the provider side or the hospital side, why couldn't those rates for all payers, for for all pay, you know Vermonters, be uh, adjusted immediately? I don't know what immediately means. So I would love to see when my bill comes to my organization a reduced amount. We buy our insurance off the exchange but if it's if it's happening real time why can't it be real time in both segments of the market well, uh, sorry i just have to answer that question for the qhps you can't adjust the rates mid-year they've already been sold to the consumers so i don't know about the other lines of business but because of the regulatory structure at the federal level on qhps that would be difficult for that market now that's a, you know seventy thousand people as opposed to some of the larger Do you have anything to add, sir or Susan? No. no. Okay. okay, other questions or comments from the public? Yes. Uh, Carmen Austin, again, from the VM Health Network. I just also wanted to bring up a point that Todd Kinney had brought up during the testimony, when it was uh, <coughs> the 28th, that we do not have different uh, fee schedules for, um, for the different payers. So. I did take a look at what the impact would be and that we would have to adjust 51 of our agreements here in Vermont. So that, that would not happen very quickly. It's a very long uh, process to um, reach agreement and settlement as to what the adjustment may be and the impact and the effect. So that I just wanted to bring up that point. Is there any other member of the public who can comment or questions? I think, um, as we think about a rate increase, Mark Stanislaus from the University of Vermont Health Network, and the detail that Carmen spoke to, um, it was filed in a response of what all those individual payer lines you know would be. So just note that that, that, that is confidential proprietary information also. But you know, I think we need to be sensitive to that if there was any change, exactly how it would hit the Vermont payers and any other commercial payers that happen to seek services here that we just don't automatically assume that it carries over to because it gets into the in-migration and out-migration too. So, you know, there's a sensitivity there. And that's part of the complexity of some of our payment schedules because some of those payment schedules are linked between the same plans. And also there's a crossover in payment um, schedules too to the all payer model too. That's the complexity that we talked about earlier that we just need to be sensitive to of when we pull that lever, you know, what's going to happen on the other side. Okay. 
Okay, is there anyone else? No, thank you. And we'll move on to um, the all payer ACO model implementation update. Uh, <coughs> join us up front. Thank you. Last week during a staff discussion of the ACO certification process, there were a couple of questions that were raised pertaining to the ACO budget. And we wanted to provide the best information we have available at this time. And also to make clear to you that we will have final information in the month of April. And we will be providing an in-depth analysis of that final information at that time. But today, uh, to answer some of the questions that were raised, I wanted to share um, some key information related to attribution to the ACO. So how many Vermonters um, by payer are attributed to one care Vermont? Plus one eight zero two five two two seven three zero seven is now exiting. Um, in, the, in the Medicare uh, population, the final um, attribution to One Care Vermont, and this is final attribution for the start of the performance year. It's very important to recognize that this is a high water mark and the attribution will decline as the performance year plays out. The attribution uh, January 1st for the start of the performance year for Medicare to One Care Vermont is 39,702 uh, Vermont Medicare beneficiaries. This differs from the projection um, in one care's uh, last budget submission um, or the information we received on December 20th. Uh, this differs from that projection which was for 33,474 lives and um, is a 19% a change. For Medicaid, the final attributed number is 42,342. Uh, differing um, by a negative 4% change from the uh, projection in December. For Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, the final number is 20,838 lives, differing from the projection in the uh, December budget submission by negative 40%. And the self-funded population that is attributed to the ACO is 9,962, and that is the same as was projected in the budget submission in December. Totally. That's the update that I have today. Do you have the total? Um, the, the total last, yes. 638,548, 140. 638,000? No. Excuse me, that was dollars, I'm sorry. Excuse me, I'm sorry. 112,844. So about 10,000 less than what we anticipated. That's correct, but as we'll discuss um, in our more in-depth presentation, the actual dollars are more than anticipated because the Medicare population has a higher per member per month amount associated with their care, and that population grew over what we anticipated. Okay. That's all I have for the update. Okay, any questions? Okay, is there any public uh, questions or comments? Okay. Yes, yeah, Susan. Uh, Susan Aronoff, the Developmental Disabilities Council. Ina, thank you very much. I'm wondering if this information is publicly available. I couldn't find the facts that you just read off anywhere. I tried to write them down as quickly as you said them, but if you could shoot an email with it or post it, that would be great. We'll post the final information that is available, and we received this um, just just before this meeting began, so it hasn't had an opportunity to be posted yet. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the public? Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Thank you, Amen. Might as well stay there. <laughs> and now we're going to have the uh, certification update. So if your colleagues could join you. Thank you, Chairman Mullen, and for the record, Melissa Moss with the Green Mountain Care Board, Ina Bacchus and Mike Barber. Um, as we reviewed last week, we uh, had went through an in-depth certification process, and we were left with two remaining items that One Care through the week has responded to us on. Uh, you have a slide in your folder describing what we were looking for and what we received. Um, so the staff had asked one care to describe its process and timeline and criteria for accepting providers into their network for 2019. And in return, one care's board of managers met yesterday and endorsed one care's timeline and 2019 network development expansion strategy. And this includes the provider types from which the ACO is seeking participation. The second uh, item that we were looking for is a policy that allows ACO participants to appeal their decisions. Um, and this is eligible participants. They had an existing provider uh, participant appeals policy and they submitted it to, and with an amended version to include eligible network participants. And so these submissions satisfy the items that we still had in process. And we also had an open public comment period from March 14th to the 20th, and we did not receive any written public comment. And so we would like to recommend One Care Vermont for their ACO certification based on our reviews. Okay, other questions? I have one question. Uh, the recommendation would be uh, for certification with the monitoring recommendations that you had outlined last week, is that right? Yes. Are there other questions? Hearing none, I'll open it up to the public. Dale? I keep having to go through my head where I want to know. You've got to speak up. I think I'm having trouble hearing this afternoon. Okay. Oh, I deal with that all the time. Um, I keep having to go through my head. What I want to know is especially after the conversations this morning, a ratio index. Like, I want to know how many primary care providers per persons in the ACO as a unit of measure. Are they serving 300 people per primary care physician? Are they serving 250? And I want to know that in different locations. I haven't totally thought this through yet, but that can help me to understand what my delivery is, what my timelines would look like, how efficient the delivery would be. And if I break it down into geographical locations, it can help me figure out where I'm not getting good performance and where I am getting good performance. I'm giving you a very high low because I haven't totally thought it through yet. But I'm wondering if that wouldn't be of value. So, Melissa? Yes, we were also considering that information, but we were, we've been waiting on the final contracts. And so once the Blue Cross contract is final with the final attributed lives, which we just received this week, the final attributed lives, um, we have considered doing that analysis and could provide it at the beginning of April working with one care okay. I wouldn't yeah okay is there other members of the public who wish to comment or have a question if not is there any member of the board who wishes to make a motion I'll make a motion um, I would move that we approve one care Vermont's certification with the monitoring recommendations uh, proposed by staff at our meeting last week. What's that? I do not know. 
Is Maureen on the phone oh, today? Is. This afternoon? Yeah. Oh, she's in. No. That is a negative. I'm sorry. We must have lost her this morning. So was there a second? I'll second. So it's been moved and seconded um, to certify with monitoring. And is there any discussion by members of the board? So hearing none, um, I guess since we don't have a member on the phone, it's safe to do it by voice vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So let the record note it was 4-0-1 uh, vote. Is there anything else you would wish to discuss with us? We don't have anything else to add on the topic of certification, but if, uh, if it's all right with you, I will give a brief in introduction to the next um, agenda item, and Rachel Block is here. That would be great. was just demonstrated by Dale's question, the topic of primary care, primary care spending, and uh, the role of primary care in health care reform is, is a very hot topic here in our state and nationally. And that's why we've asked Rachel Block here from the Milbank Memorial Foundation or Fund um, to talk with us about the work that she has done with the fund in looking at how to measure primary care spend. We thought that this would be an uh, important conversation for the board to have, um, both in the context of primary care spend as a percentage of overall health care spending in Vermont, and more specifically as we look to health care reform and the implementation of the ACO model, and how we can track over time whether that model contributes to uh, more investment in primary care. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rachel and um, thank her again for taking the time to come here today and speak with you about this important work. Well, thank you, Nina, and thanks to the board for inviting us to speak on this topic today. This is something which we've been doing quite a bit of work on for a number of years, but specifically the issues around primary care spending for the last year. I'll give you a little bit of a quick overview of the fund's involvement in developing the evidence base in support of strong primary care, and then talk in more detail about primary care spending measures from our perspective. Uh, why are we interested in these measures? Uh, what are we trying to measure and how? Uh, what are the results of a recently published study that we commissioned on this topic? The next steps for us and then potentially some opportunities for the state of Vermont to consider as you're going forward. So our mission is to improve population health by connecting leaders to the best evidence and experience. That's a very general uh, mission. And the way that we do that is to uh, build evidence through research support. This particular uh, work that I'll be describing is an example of that. We then also disseminate and work with leaders to use that evidence through those reports, through a convening of state and other leaders, and many policy leaders in the state of Vermont have participated actively in our meetings in the past. Um, examples of our work specifically relating to primary care, uh, the multi-state collaborative, this is a national effort to bring together projects that are participating in national primary care payment reform through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Lisa Dulce Watkins, who I'm sure many of you know, leads that project for us. We have published a couple of reports that focus on primary care and behavioral health integration, which is one of the elements of primary care transformation. And now we have published work on primary care spending measures, which I'll be talking about today. Why are we interested in this? Well, uh, obviously we, we do have a track record of general policy interest in primary care, uh, but specifically as it relates to primary care spending, um, we believe that we improve what we measure. And if we look at the big 
pie slice. This happens to be national health expenditures. You could take the Vermont health expenditures pie slice as well. Uh, what we'd like to know is, can we get a separate slice of this pie that we understand is being devoted to primary care? The way we approached this work was to commission research. Uh, so I want to emphasize this is a research project. It is not necessarily a policy initiative. And we commissioned uh, Baylet Health Purchasing, who I think the board and others here are familiar with. And they had a subcontract with RAND, which had uh, experience working with this data. Uh, a link to the report is included in the slides. The basic idea was to undertake a proof of concept study to determine what percentage of commercial medical spending in high performing plans went to primary care. And the scope is a very small sample of commercial health insurers from across the US. It did not include Medicaid or Medicare. Participating plans, the definition of high performing commercial plans was essentially those that had very high scores in the NCQA accreditation process. And the reason we picked high performing plans is we felt that they would be the ones that would be most likely to be spending more in primary care. So we were priming the pump a little bit, if you will, for the purpose of the study results. We also tried to make sure that the sample would be geographically representative. You'll see in terms of the numbers of plans participating, we, after that analysis, contacted 29 plans. 11 originally agreed to participate, uh, and nine were able to produce usable data. And I'll come back to some of the logistical issues associated with producing these measures later in my comments. The definition of primary care spending was developed in consultation with other researchers, including those in primary care specialty groups, and also from a few insurance commissioners. And the way that this was done simply was to work with the health plan staff, for those plans who agreed to uh, submit the data based on our specifications. And they, they would give us uh, both the levels, the actual dollar amounts, as well as percentages of total health plan spending in 2013 and 2014. We looked at two product lines, HMO and PPO, and the analysis included fee-for-service payments and also non-fee-for-service payments, those including capitation, bonus, or other shared saving kinds of arrangements. As I'm sure many are aware, these are an increasing part of total medical spending, so it was important to capture that data. We also included some uh, modest measurement of demographic and comorbidities, and I'll speak to that uh, in a moment. The measures of primary care were broken down by specialty, by service codes, and by age groups. And in a nutshell, uh, the results are that um, while much attention is often paid to defining specific types of providers and specialty categories in primary care, that there was more difference in spending amounts based on what service codes were included as opposed to which specialties were included. To try to make that a little simpler, a narrow definition of primary care specialties versus a broader <coughs> definition of primary care specialties did not yield a very significant difference in terms of the amounts and percents. But trying to define a narrow range of primary care services by codes as compared to all services provided by a primary care provider, many of which would be primary care, but some would not, that resulted in a more significant difference in the amounts and the percentages. The study also found that there was more primary care spending for children, but less for older adults. So just to give you an idea of some of the numbers, uh, the dollar amounts are listed here. And you can see that there wasn't a huge difference between the uh, PPO, HMO amounts 
23 to $26 per member per month. But part of what was interesting about the results of this study is the range of the participating plans from $14 to $38 per member per month. And in terms of percentages, we see a similar result. The differences between PPO versus HMO, not that great, 6.7 versus 7.4. But the range of all the participating plans was 3.4 to 12.5%. So that is a much more significant difference uh, looking across the full number uh, range of plans that were participating. I picked out one of the tables that's in the report. This is the age breakout. There is no 65 and over because we didn't include uh, Medicare, as you can see. Um, and it does not include Medicaid. So uh, that would have an impact, particularly in terms of the children's number, for example, we could assume would be even higher if we have the Medicaid data in there. Uh, but you can see the uh, range uh, in terms of going from the younger age groups to the older. But also, uh, again, and I kind of highlighted uh, interesting differences there among the plans, why one plan would be spending 3% and another plan spending 14%. Uh, these are interesting things that we'll be looking into in terms of future research. There are a few limitations to this study that we want to be clear about up front. One is obviously it is a small number of plans. Uh, the data were self-generated by those plans. The, the reporting was voluntary and the results were not audited. Again, this was a research study, not a regulatory matter that we were interested in. And the plans were particularly challenged to provide the data specifications, but in particular as it related to the non-fee-for-service component. But we know when it comes to primary care spending that that non-fee-for-service component is a very important part of how insurers have been promoting primary care. So it's really important for us to be able to get at that data. Also, regardless of the definition, we started with the insurer's designation of primary care provider. So next steps for us, uh, we think that this is important foundational work to begin a larger conversation. Uh, so one of our first steps is to work with states to try to replicate and validate these measures, to consider legislation or regulatory measures that would promote further use of these measures. Uh, Rhode Island and Oregon, currently by regulation and statute, uh, respectively, uh, have primary care spending measurement reporting in place. And also both of those states have now prescribed minimum thresholds for health plans to spend and the activities around primary care spending that they need to uh, contribute to. So we'd like to at least start with working with more states to replicate these measures and see uh, what the results are when we do that. In Oregon, uh, they found, uh, going back to the range among the small sample of plans that we had, uh, they had a range from approximately five, six percent on the commercial side to about 12% for Medicaid. And so they uh, subsequently enacted legislation uh, which will require all health plans to spend 12% over a five-year period coming up. So essentially using Medicaid in their case as the benchmark for primary care spending performance. In addition to trying to spread this work among more states, uh, we will be working on disseminating these results through professional meetings and articles. And we're also hoping to both spur and participate in broader discussions on this topic. Collaborating with, I should have said, primary care specialty societies and researchers to continue the dialogue on how to further refine the definitions. We are sponsoring additional research phase one to look at Medicare data and how the primary care spending measures look might be of interest to the board considering the participation of Medicare in the all-payer model. 
We want to connect with others nationally around the development and use of measures. And we've had some very encouraging discussions recently with NCQA, which is interested in a bigger national study of primary care spend, and also the Healthcare Cost Institute, which included an analysis of primary care spending in their last national healthcare spending <coughs> report. And finally, uh, we intend to continue our support for multi-payer models for primary care support and use that platform as an opportunity to continue discussion as far as local or regional efforts around primary care pain reform are concerned. So the things that we're discussing with states, uh, I mentioned the opportunity to consider legislation uh, or regulation. We have Oregon and uh, Rhode Island as our models today. Colorado will be introducing legislation, I believe, this week. Uh, and I heard that uh, California may have a legislation being introduced as well. Um, but we'd also like to explore how primary care spending measures may be aligned with other measures that are being used in statewide initiatives, such as the all-payer model here, or in other states where either ACO or total cost of care measures are being used for different projects. And clearly there could be applicability here, not just at the state level, but also at the regional level, to the extent that there are significant numbers of regional collaboratives looking at enhanced primary care support generating primary care spending measures using local data and monitoring primary care spending in conjunction with their local um, advanced payment model and ACO activities. So in conclusion, uh, we feel the policy and evidence suggests that it is important to measure primary care investment. We think primary care is important but we don't have the data to show what we're spending on it or how we're increasing that commitment over time. Uh, research and state efforts suggest at this time it is feasible to develop and use primary care spending measures. There are administrative <laughs> issues to take into account. Resources are required and you need to plan for it, whether that's on the insurer side, if the approach is to ask the insurers to submit this data in a certain format, <clears throat> or on the state convener side, should a state choose to use its all-payer database or any other database that a state may have to try to generate these measures on their own. And it's important, as with all matters relating to data and measurement, uh, to have a transparent process and some vehicle to ensure that there's trust in the data that's being used. In terms of policy issues, I'm sure this will come up in today's discussion. Um, it's important to consider building to purpose. So what is the desired unit of analysis? What level of detail or precision is needed? Uh, as I made clear, for us this was initially a research project, but as we get these measures in use in both, whether it's state-driven activities or private activities, uh, I'm sure there will be an interest in even further refinement and levels of detail of the information. It is important to standardize measures in order to facilitate valid comparisons. We would love to see these measures standardized nationally, but we need to also uh, grow the usage of these data from a grassroots perspective as well. We're interested in looking at establishing or validating the relationship of primary care spending to total cost measures. We know some of the national advocates who are supporting increased investment in primary care are concerned that they're not viewed as saying that that investment will also increase total cost of care. They want to have increased primary care spending considered in relation to monitoring or holding down increases in total cost of care. But we need the spending measures in order to be able to develop that methodology in a systematic way. And finally, it's important to have these measures in order to evaluate the impact of various all-payer models or value-based payments on primary care sensitive types of performance measures. So perhaps establishing the relationship between spending and some of the uh, utilization and outcome measures that we're interested in associated with 
a strong primary care system. I include this not because it has anything to do with primary care spending, but uh, this is the basic components of the CPC Plus model, which is a very robust model of primary care. And the reason I include it is simply to illustrate that a primary care spending measure is not an end in itself. Um, and it does not capture the full complexity of all of the things that we're interested in in terms of measuring primary care. But we still think it is a simple and feasible measure as a piece of this puzzle to be able to better understand uh, how primary care fits in the total spend discussion. I've included my contact information as well as Lisa's if you're interested in following up on either our work on primary care spending or total cost of care issues or the multi-state collaborative. And I've also included a number of references and links uh, that the board and the public can use to learn more about this topic. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rachel. Questions from the board? I have one, Tom. So I'm just trying to uh, connect the dots here that um, where we started out with the NHAE, NHE expenditure pie, and then as we go a few pages later, we have that um, payments equal about 7% of spending. So if if uh, your work were to be incorporated <coughs> after we scrub through the methodology uh, in this NHE pie, would it, would its slice be about six or seven percent? We don't know for sure, but it's it's a reasonable guesstimate at this point in terms of the little bit of data. So, for example, I mentioned the Healthcare Cost Institute report, which came out a month or so ago. Their primary care spend number, if I remember correctly, came to about 6%. Um, that was also only commercial health plan data, but it's a big national database. Um, so um, again, if you included Medicare and Medicaid, um, the numbers might uh, be a little bit higher or lower. Uh, so that's as close as we have now to uh, a national measure, if you will. Um, and as I mentioned, we're talking to them about possibly using our measure and creating a separate report that would focus more deep, more, more specifically on primary care spending. And I, I noticed in your uh, approach to this that uh, the New England region was more heavily weighted in terms of the insurance companies you work with. I think um, after you after it filtered down to the nine, did any of them do uh, business in Vermont? Um, I don't know because uh, it was agreed that we would not disclose who those plans were. And we didn't, again, we started with a, a, a total uh, uh, number to work with of 29. Uh, it largely got whittled down based on their capacity or ability to provide the analysis that we needed. Question. I was curious about what direction Oregon went, went with their definition of, we've had two different workers in Vermont work on the issue of defining primary care for two different purposes. Uh, and so those estimates did vary depending on which sort of purpose it was for. But I was curious where Oregon landed. I can answer from a process perspective, which is uh, Oregon developed their uh, definition in legislation. So the definition was part of a legislative process. Yeah, and one of our definitions was also part of a legislative process, and that was the broader definition. Right. So um, I can't speak to the details of the, they decided this one should be in and this one shouldn't. Um, the one interesting fact about Oregon is they decided to include psychiatry in their definition of, in their statutory definition of primary care. Um, I think it's part of the reason we wanted people to see uh, what the differences were based on uh, whether a, a narrower group or a broader group of specialties were included, that at least as far as the specialty side of things were concerned, it didn't make a huge amount of difference. 
However, I think that where there's probably going to be even more uh, uh, discussion when it comes to really evaluating the spending piece is uh, that portion of services which you could really attribute to primary care, which is a slightly different question than defining the specialties or the providers who are uh, uh, providing. Uh, and that's why we, we want to continue our uh, connection to some of the national researchers who are spending a lot of their time also focused on those, uh, those discussions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Uh, don't go anywhere yet. Does any member of the public wish to? Dale. <laughs> on your um, part that is in this, could you possibly help me understand better? There's been per children, but I'm trying to figure out what was their infrastructure? Did they have shortage of primary care doctors? Um, and it's, there's so many things that can affect what they've done versus if we tried to do the same thing. Can you help me get a better visualization of that? I can just tell you a little bit. I'm not an expert in every aspect of what's going on in Oregon. But I will say uh, this, uh, they had a primary care initiative similar to the Blueprint for Health that was ongoing for a period of time. So there was at least a segment of their policy and payer community and provider community that had come together around the idea of increasing investment in primary care. They also had developed for Medicaid their uh, coordinated care organization model, which is kind of like an ACO model, uh, which applies to Medicaid and their expansion uh, covered population. Uh, and that model is very comprehensive in terms of uh, care management on a person-centered, population-based uh, kind of model. So I mentioned those two things just to say that Oregon has a history of interest in investment in primary care and uh, have committed to a pretty robust care management model, at least for their Medicaid population. And I would suspect that uh, that is one of the reasons that the primary care spending number for their Medicaid CCOs was almost twice what it was in the uh, commercial sector. Um, but again, until we have more longitudinal information and then can get into more of the detail, which they will look at, to see not only how much is being spent, but what it's being spent on, it's difficult to really draw a lot of other conclusions until we have some more data. But that just reinforces our interest in having standardized measures and longitudinal uh, use of those measures so that we'll have a better base of analysis to work from and draw conclusions. Okay, is there anyone else? Yes, Susan. Um, hi, Susan Yarnoff from the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. I just wanted to follow up on one thing you just said in your last reply when you described the model in Oregon and you said it was kind of like an ACO model. Could you clarify, my understanding is that Oregon is not using accountable care organizations, um, you know, the, the corporate model, but that they have a different kind of commun community collaborative that they're using? It's, I, I, I did say ACO-like, um, but yes, they call them coordinated care organizations, and that is uh, an amalgam, of, they're regionally based, and it's an amalgam of payers uh, providers and community-based organizations who come together in order to uh, organize and provide care coordination services for almost the whole Medicaid population and almost all Medicaid services. So it is um, a little more comprehensive in terms of the service package that they're responsible for. It does include a specific um, uh, inclusion of community-based organizations but it also is only for the Medicaid population. OK, 
Okay, no one else. Seeing none, thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you for inviting us, and we'll be interested to monitor your work in this area as you go forward. Great, thank you. Is Sarah here? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so you weren't from. <laughs> well, Sarah's getting set up. Maybe I just want to say, relevant to our last presentation, that I think this is an area that I'm really glad we followed up on from our previous conversations around measuring primary care, both in the ACO budget process, but also in uh, great review, like that, and stuff. So, um, thanks for getting that scheduled. It actually was interesting timing because I had to ask Sarah just a few weeks ago, right, to try to figure out what was the primary care spend in the box. So. <laughs> just all casually mentioned it. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Sarah Lindberg, uh, Health Services Researcher, Green Mountain Care Board, uh, and I'm just here today to give a very high level series of examples about why data can be weird. <laughs> so the specific topic we're gonna look at is um, comparing health expenditure data. Um, and we're looking at three examples which I think do a great job of highlighting kind of the trade-offs between different data sources. So the first one is affectionately known as the Kaiser data, um, but actually is a data source that comes from CMS that comes out about every five years um, called the State Healthcare Expenditure Accounts, or SHEA. Um, they're actually an extension of something called the National Healthcare Expenditure Accounts, which they are the official expenditure estimates that uh, the Office of the Actuary at CMS puts out every year. Um, this state level stuff only comes out every five-ish years, largely due to the fact that it's based on the economic census, which it only comes out every five years or so. Um, the second data source we'll talk about is the Vermont Healthcare Expenditure Analysis, or the yeah. <laughs> I, I think of it as the EA, but, um, and that is something that um, we have, and I'm glad Lori's here. It goes back to what, the 92? So we've, it's pretty long uh, standing data source that we've, um, you know, it hasn't always been with the Green Mountain Care Board, but it's been with whatever entity used to be the Green Mountain Care Board since then. And then a very specific uh, data source, the Dartmouth Atlas of Health, which is um, part of the Dartmouth Institute. Um, in our neighbors to the east. Um, so yeah, trade-offs. Data are all about trade-offs. So at a very high level, I kind of think of um, three dimensions for comparing these data sources. The first one is how comprehensive is it? Is it really kind of a laser-like focus on a certain type of data, or does it try to incorporate information across um, payer sources or different sources of information that may or may not be claims-based? So, um, both the, the um, state health accounts and our expenditure analysis are, are pretty good for that sort of thing. So um, the way the Dartmouth Atlas is just limited to Medicare claims for the most part, so it's not going to give you as um, kind of an expansive picture of expenditures as the other two data sources. Um, of the two, um, the Vermont Healthcare Expenditure Analysis is the most comprehensive um, because it includes things such as administrative expenses um, and can kind of the, whereas the, the state health care accounts don't include admin or the net cost of insurance or um, investments in infrastructure or anything like that. Um, the next dimension is whether or not it's derived from a detailed data source. What I think of is it built from the bottom up or the top down. So SHEA is, you know, for, first and foremost, a top down analysis. So they take very high level stuff and try to break it out into pieces, whereas both the Vermont healthcare expenditure analysis and the Dartmouth Atlas are from the bottom up. Um, there are components to the Vermont healthcare expenditure analysis that um, all we have is a kind of a statewide total, but that's the, you know, that's what it is. <laughs> so um, I think it's, it's uh, probably, you know, the second most uh, granular of these data sources and the Dartmouth Atlas would be the most granular because it comes from detailed claims. Um, and finally is the comparability. So there's uh, always this tension in data. Do you want something that's really specific to what you're measuring or do you want something that you can compare in a wide variety of situations? Kind of the difference between something that's generalizable and specific. And um, for the, that component, the healthcare expenditure analysis is really a Vermont, um, Vermont jam. It's hard to compare to other things. 
Um, the Dartmouth Atlas is Medicare data, uh, traditional fee-for-service Medicare data, which is so great for comparison across states. So it's probably the best in that dimension. And the she is pretty darn good. Um, the only trade-off there is, um, so, and this goes into the next slide, but um, since the um, healthcare expenditure accounts are based on national survey data, um, it sometimes doesn't do a great job of representing Vermont or other small states. Um, so for instance, the economic census um, has started sampling smaller businesses and a lot of our physician offices not associated with a hospital um, may not be included in that sample. <laughs> um, but uh, the trade-off there is that it's the same data across um, all the states. So it's national survey data. The big ones, as I said, were the economic um, census. They also rely heavily on the American Hospital Association's survey that they put out each year that Vermont's hospitals participate in. They also use administrative data from like the VA and uh, Medicaid. Um, and they do use some information from Medicare claims to help do some adjustments, um, as well as IRS financial data. Um, on the other end of the spectrum is our expenditure analysis, where we have very detailed information at our hands. We've got um, VCURES, which is our all payer claims database which has um, information on Vermont residents who uh, are covered by an, a, a payer with at least 200 lives commercially and then Medicare and Medicaid. We have our hospital budget data, which has uh, got a lot of different looks at um, hospital expenditures than maybe the um, uh, hospital survey does. Um, we also include information from the Vermont Hospital Health Insurance Survey, which is something we put out periodically that has a lot of um, really good information specific to Vermont. Um, and then again, Dartmouth Atlas is mostly just uh, Medicare claims. They do bring in a few other data sources to help age adjust um, their inf uh, age and sex adjust um, their discharge rates. And they, get, they also get some um, hospital like geographic information from the Hospital Association survey. Too fast, too slow. <laughs> good. <You're> doing good. <laughs> OK. <laughs> um, yeah, so then, so this is why it's known as the um, Kaiser data, is because Kaiser did a great job of making um, the Shia information really easy to use and access. So you can, um, you know, see that you are able to look at maps or trends. Uh, and then here you have um, the different dimensions that it breaks it out to. So there's, you know, hospital care, physician and clinical services, other professional services, prescription drugs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so here is why I think this came up as Vermont ranks number three in its hospital spend as um, measured by the Shia. Um, again, this is just personal healthcare expenditures. It's not gonna include admin costs or the net cost of private health insurance. It doesn't include any government activities, which is a big component in Vermont. Um, it also doesn't include uh, investments in things such as research, infrastructure, or equipment. Um, there also is an article in Health Affairs that kind of, I think actually uh, board member Holmes, Dr. Holmes uh, circulated that article before the Kaiser data were circulated, um, which kind of talks about um, the healthcare expenditure trends and how the real story seems to be what's going on in states that chose to expand their Medicaid programs versus those that did not. Um, so, um, I would like to caution people not to get too invested in the sector level estimates because they can be deceptive. Um, so for instance, if you were just going to look at that to compare Connecticut and Vermont, Vermont ranks third in its hospital care spend and Connecticut rates 23rd and you know there's a 30% difference in the spend there but overall they rank five and six. So there's actually only a 3% difference overall in that spend. Um, so one of the confounders when you look at care in Vermont is how much of our delivery system is affiliated with our hospital networks. So um, if you look at just the physician and clinical services, we actually rank 31st. We look like kind of a good deal if you were to just look at that dimension. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Uh, you know, the higher level is better when you're trying to do these comparisons uh, with this data source. And so if you look at us, uh, we're the green line, um, and you can see this is kind of our trend according to this data source. This is the per capita spend over time um, compared to the US. So um, up here is DC. <laughs> so um, the other thing that you'll notice whenever you're dealing with per capita estimates is they can be a lot um, funkier for a smaller population. So the smaller your denominator is, the more um, sensitive you can be to kind of noise. Um, but you will notice that there is a strong regional effect. So um, that one on the top is the Northeast. 
um, right below, uh, not right below, but then they're kind of chunked together here, um, ranging from the Midwest um, to the uh, West. And then in the middle there's the US uh, average and the uh, whoever else in the South. So uh, you can see these curves all pretty much following the same trajectory. And again, that's really a factor that it's a bottom, uh, top down analysis. So you know, they, these, these, these are built from the national estimates and then meted out, uh, which is why that looks so suspiciously <laughs> similar. Uh, so and another thing, so price can be a major um, confounder here. It doesn't adjust for price, age, anything like that. Uh, so yeah, so just another note on methodology. So the way that they work is they uh, start with their national estimates. Then they make this, they try to figure out where the care was delivered or what we think of as a provider-based analysis. So whenever you're doing healthcare research, you know, there's a big decision you have to think about. Do you care about where the care was delivered or do you care about to whom it was delivered? So the care delivered in Vermont is not necessarily going to look the same as the care delivered to Vermonters. They're very different questions and uh, ways to look at the problem. So the way that Chia starts is it starts with where the care was delivered, um, how much care was delivered in places with a Vermont zip code. <laughs> um, and then they adjust those to try and account for where people live. So they basically make this 51 by 51 grid. Um, one, you know, the columns are where the person lives, the rows are where the care was delivered, and then they build up this ratio of uh, where the, what would happen to residents over where the care was delivered. And they call this the net patient flow. And Vermont is considered an exporter, meaning that the amount of care delivered on behalf of Vermonters is greater than that delivered in Vermont. So that we are actually at 112%, we're a bit of an outlier. The only state uh, with a greater exporting ratio is Wyoming at 124%. Um, so again, you might, your first question I say is, does that may be affected by sample size? Um, but essentially what they'll do is take the care delivered in Vermont for all the Medicare service sectors and multiply it by 112%. And that's how they decide how much was delivered to Vermonters. Um, they just consider all Medicaid spend to be for Vermonters. They don't do any adjustment there. Um, but for the private um, or all other coverage, they incorporate um, HCUP, which is a national database of uh, discharges to uh, just for the case mix for the inpatient uh, services. And they do something similar for the uh, physician claims, but unfortunately, the data source they use to adjust the, that information is something called Market Scan, produced by Truvin, and the blues don't submit to it. So our <laughs> big major payers not have information in there. So any weighting they do might be uh, biased. Um, they also are pretty upfront in their methodology that it's not uh, the Shia is not great for adjusting for seasonal migration. So snowbirds get dinged; um, they just associate it with the primary residents. Now, I'm not as familiar with NCH, uh, the data source for Medicare information that they're using. So um, I know in VCures, it's always the mailing address on the first of the month, but I'm not sure how exactly they're counting residency. I couldn't find that in their documentation. Can you explain the snowbird thing? Oh, yeah. So, um, <laughs> so they're saying, um, they're saying that uh, since there's no way to account for more than one residency in their, in their database, if you go to Florida for three months, but say don't change your mailing address, all that spend is gonna come back to Vermont, even though you technically may have been a resident of Florida, depending on your definition. Like tax, they love to talk about definitions of residency. <laughs> so what about all the people that come here to ski? How are they treated? Right, so they, yeah, we would get the reverse effect for that. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't hazard to guess the magnitude of that effect. My hunch is that since one is largely Medicare, I would guess that the snowbirds would ding us more than the skiers, but that, that's just thinking off the top of my head. Don't quote me. Sorry. Um, all right, so the expenditure analysis, again, it's something that we do here. Uh, and uh, I think that the next one will be ready in the spring here, coming up uh, within the next month or so, next couple of months, I should say. Um, but uh, this is just an excerpt. You can see the most recent uh, presentation uh, here. There's the URL. Um, but we do make sure to compare our per capita expenses, uh, expenses to the NHEA's uh, per capita expenses over time. 
Um, and we also look at the percentage of uh, domestic product uh, and do those kind of comparisons. It's a very rich data source. Um, I really think that you know there's a lot of really great stuff in there. And Lori and her team work super hard to get it um, prepared every year. And one thing that the data team would like to assist with and is currently trying to figure out uh, implementation strategy is to make it more in a Kaiser format, more of a kind of friendly dashboard to make it more accessible to people. So um, I think that'll be something that we can um, add to it. Um, but if you look at the trends between our um, expenditure analysis and the CMS expenditure analysis, you know, I would say that's that's a pretty similar trend. I mean, I know it, it, there's there's a gap here, but if you look at the the slopes of these lines, the rise over run, um, you know, the estimated increase over time is only about 100 bucks, which I know adds up over time. But you know, I would say that they're not measuring the same thing, but they're measuring something that's correlated. So you know, it it, it would make sense to me that um, you know, <laughs> given that the the bottom up and top down nature that. Um, I'd be more alarmed if they were exactly the same, frankly. <laughs> this is total spend? Yeah, yeah. This is the per capita spend, actually. So the per capita total spend, comparing those two data sources. Uh, and can you break that out by hospital service area or no? Yeah, uh, we certainly can break out components of it by hospital service area for the expenditure analysis. And that's one of the enhancements that we're actively thinking about how to build in. Um, again, the question is going to be, um, are you interested in the service area of where the care was delivered or where people live? Because again, that really makes a difference. And so we would want to do some thinking about what and why we're looking for that breakout. Well, for example, this morning we had a hospital say they were the third um, least expensive hospital in the state. <laughs> and I'm just wondering what data source that was from. So. Yeah, I can follow up on that. I, I, uh, I probably missed that part of the presentation, but yeah. And the catchment areas are a whole other animal. And that's like one I've been talking to other states about this, where one of, you know, care patterns don't respect state lines, <laughs> which is OK with V cures, but that's not going to tell the whole story either. So you know, there, there are exciting challenges that we'll um, be happy to help address. I'm glad you're excited, Sarah. <laughs> we, we can give you lots of excitement. <laughs> Uh, and then finally, just a word about the, the Dartmouth Atlas for Health. This is a really incredible tool. I don't know if you've had time to hang out on their website, dartmouthatlas.org. Um, but they do a really fantastic job of talking about um, different types of service. They do some chronic conditions work. Um, and this is really um, provider basis. So what they do is they look at what is called hospital referral regions. And what they say is, OK, so for this Burlington uh, hospital referral region, what's this is you, you kind of think of it as a catchment area. But it's like, where do people go for the majority of their um, neurology and I think it's cardiac uh, complicated procedures? And then they kind of build these boundaries that way. So it's much different than a hospital or primary care service area. And then they adjust it for um, age, sex, and if you choose price. This is just adjusted for age and sex. And you can see that um, on the scale here, um, Burlington's HSA is one of the you know, better deals um, in the region compared to you know, things get you know, red, red is more in this scale. Um, so, and, and you'll see Vermont really is, is mostly between two hospital referral regions. Can anyone guess the other one? Um, <laughs> uh, but we have a little bit of Albany and a little bit, bit of Springfield, Massachusetts. So we really kind of have four referral regions that touch the re region, but there's um, two, two major players. Um, and so one of the things you can look at is trends over time. So this is just, again, Medicare, but it's the Medicare reimbursements. So the top line is Springfield, Mass. Um, Albany, New York is the blue line. Um, Burlington, Vermont is the red line. And then Lebanon, New Hampshire is the other one. So this is kind of um, the reimbursements per enrollee, um, just again, adjusting for age, sex, and race um, at the HRR level. Um, so yeah, it's hard to know what to, they have a lot of really wonderful information and stuff that I would love to replicate on an all-payer basis um, you know, as we're gearing up our analytical efforts here. Um, so yeah, just to kind of summarize, uh, no data source is perfect, which is why I'm always so excited. 
Uh, <laughs> the, and the, the best way to answer a question, it depends on the question or questions that we're asking. And you know, that's kind of what, what we're here for, is to help you answer um, questions as best we can, and then we'll give you a long list of boring caveats that you can stick in your footnote. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I just think that it's really, you know, one takeaway I would love for people to always keep in mind is whether you're looking on who the care was delivered to or where it was delivered, totally different world. So um, that's why, like, when you talk about ACO budgets versus hospital budgets, it's completely kind of different lenses when you're trying to think about this stuff. So, uh, yeah, any questions, comments, concerns? I have a comment um, that really is a follow-up of what you just said in terms of it, the question does matter. And I think one of the areas that we, uh, as a board, have been talking about for a while, and I personally have been talking about probably since the day I got here, is doing a, being able to crosswalk across the different regulatory processes. So uh, I think I would love for you to think about that as you're considering sort of recommendations about different analytics and, and different ways we should be using data, uh, is that it, ACO budgets are different than hospital budgets, but we need to be able to crosswalk between the two. More excitement. Great. <laughs> <laughs> anytime, Sarah, anytime. You need excitement, let me know. Yeah. Other questions or comments from the board? Now we'll open it up to the public. Any member of the public have a question or a comment? Mark. Actually, Mark Stanislaw from the University of Vermont Health Network. Thank you. This has been very helpful, and particularly on the SHIA data. And I think you know, getting well, to Robin's point, is the hospitals really want to understand what part of the cost curve they are driving, versus the assumption that. Anything in healthcare spend is driven by the hospital. Okay, so just as an example, um, um, on the SHIA data, um, their expense base for the hospital spend, understanding that she cautioned against looking at sectors, was was two point. Oh, I guess I'm just <laughs> yeah. yeah, so is is it is two point nine billion dollars? Okay, our Green Mountain. Care Board budget for all of the hospitals for that same time period was $2.1 billion. That included physician services, that included some net patient, or um, uh, some skilled nursing facilities, and just by my rough math, if you took those out, that would knock it down to about $1.7 billion that would be left. And then obviously, you know, the population number, ho hopefully there's no differences. I think the number they used was 627,000. So, so that difference is very important. Um, and to understand where those numbers are coming from, if we are serious about lowering the cost curve. Because the focus needs to be what's driving more of the cost. Just the assumption then that it's the hospitals that are driving that cost. And what makes me feel that there might be an imbalance in that relationship um, just when I take a look at the University of Vermont Medical Center and compare it to its academic peers through double AMC, they are in the top quartile of cost and quality. Okay? Um, taking a look at all of Vermont and taking a look at the Commonwealth Report, Vermont is ranked number one overall, number one over access and affordability, number one in prevention and treatment, number 12 in, in, in avoidable hospital use and cost, number five in healthy lives, and number two in um, equity. So it's just, on one hand, we're hearing the hospitals are adding more and more cost to the system, are driving up the premiums. And we go to these other you know, resources, and that 112% makes some sense now. Because okay, how do you regulate the care that's going outside of your state? One of the goals of the all-payer model is how do we bring that care into the state? That's counterproductive to the net patient service revenue viewpoint, by the way. Okay, and, 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 and then just a very specific number for the University of Vermont Medical Center in the most recent cost survey, which is through the um, AAMC, all academic medical centers, there's about 105, okay? And there was 92, you know, respondents were 
they're, um, well, they're, well, the wage index and case mix index adjusted, cost per adjusted discharge was 86.46, okay? That was in the top quartile, the most favorable cost. They're 50% of the system. So if you have 50% of the system in the top quartile of the other academic medical centers, it's hard to make these correlations. So anything we can do to draw better correlations to it, exactly what's driving the cost, where the focus needs to be to drive the cost down. And once again, I'm gonna throw my worry out there that if, if all of that is put on the burden of the hospitals to make up this difference, and they are not the driving factor of this, I worry about the financial sustainability of the whole hospital system. So I think it's important to understand all of these you know, differences and the correlation, bless you, um, um, to the all-payer model. But I mean, very informed, thank you. I would just say, Mark, that really sucks that you've got to go where the money is, and the hospitals are where the largest share of the money is. Well, there's some exporting there. That I think we need to get our arms around that. We are one of the highest export states in the nation, so. Okay, other questions? Dale? If I go back to the slide that shows that one, I remember a conversation around I have to have a certain size population to even deliver some services. Thinking that way, when I look at this map, I have the difference in cost from region to region, but what could this possibly tell me in terms of the University of Vermont Medical Center that it needs that region, at least that region, to even have the cost that it has? Or can you break it down to look at that and that way? I mean, because if you're going to talk about driving costs, doesn't that become part of the equation and the data? My cost is also associated with how many I'm actually serving. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think this is a little bit different with to look at it, but I think what you're saying is that like maybe we should build like a brain surgery center in Newport. <laughs> well, yeah, but you also mentioned the cross, the cross boundary right. issue. Those are different cultures. Those are different. Right. Right, and I think that it kind of speaks to access as well because it, you know if you notice, so these like there's not even enough information up here. So you know the the distance that people have to travel to get these services might kind of uh, confound the hospital referral regions. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any, any other member of the public? Not, thank you very much, Sarah. Is there any old business to come before the board? Uh, we did not. Would you like to make a motion? Are you going to move on the minutes today? Well, these are the minutes from the last meeting that we did. They were not done yet. They had to be corrected this morning. I believe they're all correct right now, correct? Everybody reviewed those and had an opportunity. We're good to go. Yep. So I move that we approve the minutes uh, on March 21st. I second. So it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Monday, March 21st without any corrections, additions, or deletions. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Those minutes are approved. Um, so hearing no old business, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I'll second. Second. <laughs> I don't want to adjourn. <laughs>
Could the group executive to adjourn all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye.